The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the African China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, a senior China Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, in our last discussion on debt, which was just actually a couple weeks ago when we interviewed Ma Xinyue on uh, the China's debt sustainability uh, document that the white paper that they issued earlier this year, you said something very interesting that caught my attention about how this is more or less a settled issue among the think tank crowd. Uh, that there is no such thing as the debt trap narrative. And yet that really was very interesting because I do think there is an emerging consensus now among a certain group of people that the debt trap narrative uh, has, for the most part, been debunked. Uh, We've seen over the past year essays by Deborah Braudigam at the China Africa Research Initiative, Damien Ma at Macro Polo, uh, any number of scholars and think tank analysts who've kind of said, yeah, this isn't adding up. That said, uh, there it still comes up. The United States government, none other than uh, the former Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, his successor Mike Pompeo, uh, and then, of course, Peter Navarro, who's the Director of Office and Trade and Manufacturing, who is, of course, the big hawk on China. They continue to push this line very, very aggressively. And it came up just this week, actually, when uh, the Solomon Islands switched their, uh, their allegiance from Taiwan to China. And one of the concerns now is that by switching their allegiance that came up, the Financial Times reported that there's actually concerns now that Solomon Islands will fall into a debt trap to China because of all the loans that are coming there. So, Cobus, we are still hearing it, parts of it coming through in the media and by the United States government, by a number of politicians who do believe that this is actually a thing and a very real thing at that. I think it's a bit of a, it seems to me a bit of a confusion of terms in a way, you know, because clearly debt is a big issue. Debt is, debt is, an, is a serious uh, load for any kind of population to carry. Um, and some of, some of the Chinese BRI projects have proven to be, you know, overly heavy on debt and probably, you know, didn't, they're not able to really pay for themselves. So that is an issue. That's a, that's a real issue that's, that's, you know, that the international community is trying to deal with. The the question is is whether all of this fits into this very neat I think overly neat narrative of 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 a debt trap. So the the idea that China is essentially on purpose indebting poor countries in order to then gain kind of leverage over them to you know to take over state assets or so and that that narrative has not panned out I think. And this is very much a topic in Africa where there are debt concerns in Zambia, in Djibouti, in Kenya, and a number of different places. And I guess part of the issue is that a lot of people just are not clear on what the Chinese intentions are. And that's in part because the Chinese themselves have not articulated. And also, we've heard this when it comes to the BRI, a lot of Chinese don't actually know. There is a lot of confusion as to what the BRI is, what it stands for, and what it is. So we're going to try today and dig a little bit deeper into this debt trap issue. We've talked about it before, but we've got two great guests who have adding a lot of insight into the debate. Uh, we're thrilled to have back on the show Matt Furchin, who's a non-resident scholar at the Carnegie Chinhua Center in Beijing. You will have heard Matt several times on the show before. Uh, he's a specialist in uh, China's political economic relations with emerging economies. We've talked to him about China-Latin America relations, uh, and uh, we're thrilled to have him back joining us from Leiden today. Good morning to you, Matt. Oh, thanks so much for having me again. And uh, really excited for the first time on the show, Anarchy Pereira, who's a lecturer in international politics and economics at the China Foreign Affairs University in Beijing. Uh, she conducts research on China-Sri Lanka relations with a focus on economic development. A very good evening to you, Anarchy from Beijing. Thank you. A very good evening to you, too. And thank you for having me. It's very exciting to have you because what we are going to do is we're going to start our conversation with the linchpin of the debt trap narrative. Now, let's refresh everybody very quickly about where this all started. Back on January 23rd, 2017, we can trace the origins of the words debt trap. It was in a Project Syndicate article uh, by Brahma Chalani, 
uh, entitled China's Debt Trap Diplomacy, and that is the origin of the word. And since then, it has taken a life of its own. Now, so much of this anarchy comes back to your part of the world. You are a native of Sri Lanka and the famous port at Habandota. And that is the case study that almost everybody who promotes, uh, promotes the, the debt trap narrative uh, uses as the example and says, well, look what happened in Habandota. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on Habandota, but I think we have to address it, particularly for someone with your expertise about what it is and how does it fit into this story. And then we're going to get into the infrastructure issues that you and Matt talked about in an article that you published on the Carnegie Chinhua Center's website, Why Unsustainable Chinese Infrastructure Deals Are a Two-Way Street. So let's go right off the bat to Habandota. Give us your assessment of whether or not that actually does fit the debt trap narrative. Yeah, I think the Habandota report is a great place to start because in many ways it has become the poster child for Chinese debt trap diplomacy. And I think this is largely fooled by a lot of misinformation and and not just misinformation, but also a mischaracterization of the port's dealings and the broader context in which these dealings took place. So one of the biggest misconceptions that people have very much accepted to be true um, is that the government was compelled to quote unquote, hand over the port for 99 years because the specific loan had become too onerous and the government could not afford to pay it off. But actually, across the board, um, the general consensus, both among academics and policymakers in Sri Lanka, is that the government could, in fact, have continued to pay off that loan if it wanted to. Um, Yes, the loans were obtained at commercial rates of about 6.3%. This is higher than most interest rates on Chinese loans to Sri Lanka. But each loan had a grace period of around five years and I think a payback period of more than 15 years. So it was a long-term loan and the individual payments on the loan were actually quite manageable. However, uh, it is my understanding that in 2017, when the government decided to go uh, for the debt to equity swap on the Hambantu report, there were some concerns about upcoming debt obligations over the next three to four years. So the government at the time really recognized the need to restructure the debt on some of the projects that hadn't been as profitable as they had hoped it would. And of course, the Hambantu report was one of these projects. So really, it was a commercial decision that the government made based on an understanding that the country needed to boost its reserves in the short term in order to service its debt obligations in the long term. And I personally don't think that this was a bad decision. While I understand that the optics of of the deal are not ideal, um, I agree that there was a need to seek investment into the port at that time. Uh, and one of the reasons I agree is because the government also opted for a public-private partnership model, and PPPs have had a, a long history of, of successes in Sri Lanka, particularly in port-related uh, industries. So I think that overall this was a good commercial decision that the government made. But yes, so overall we can say that, you know, the decision to restructure the debt to 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 go for a debt to equity swap on the Hamantu report, it was motivated by debt concerns. But these concerns were not related specifically to Hamantu report and they were not specific to the the port itself, but largely to the country's overall debt portfolio so you know the 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 narrative that that was seen in the on in the outside world was that china quote unquote china you know whoever the, that particular china is then took over Hambantota port 
And then it kind of turns into this almost like this, you know, dot, dot, dot ellipsis. You know, we're not 100% sure, like, what, what happened after that. Um, what is the current state of the Hamban Dota port? And what is the current state of, 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 of the Chinese involvement there? And then also, like, which particular Chinese entities are we talking about? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. So I think it was Deborah Brodigam on this very podcast uh, who said, yes. you know, Hamban Dota port is a, is a project that really hasn't had time to prove its merits. And I completely agree with her sentiment on this that you know the debt to equity swap happened very recently there hasn't sort of been a lot of time for us to assess uh, how successful it's going to be but from what we can see currently uh, the port is already generating more profit than it was in uh, 2017 and according to more recent government statistics I think employment has tripled and the number of sh uh, sort of cargo coming in has increased by something like four times um, so in terms of you know its operational success I think it needs more time for us to really assess that but from what we are beginning to see it seems to uh, be uh, on a more upward trajectory than it was before. Matt, let me talk to you a little bit about if it's not the f a debt trap. So if you and your article, you and Anarchy, and a lot of scholars now are coming out saying the debt trap narrative simply doesn't add up. It does. We're not seeing the second part of it, which is this idea that the Chinese are using debt and then trying to leverage the debt for either strategic assets or blatant influence. There are some hints on influence, but that's a harder thing to prove. Um, you in your paper then write, uh, it is import important to acknowledge how host countries have made poor, politicized, or simply corrupt decisions when selecting project and striking deals with China. And that brings me back to my old saying, which I've used for 30 years surviving in China, never assign conspiracy when mediocrity and incompetence will do. And so... <laughs> And uh, so I'm wondering, okay, if it's not a conspiracy or a, some grand strategic plan, is it corruption? Is it incompetence? Is it poor decision making? What is it then that's leading these countries, not just in Africa, but also in Asia and Latin America, to make these decisions and to get overwhelmed in Chinese debt? Yeah, well, I, th I think that's the the issue we really wanted to address. Uh, something that I was, you know, keen to talk a little bit more about was this idea of of agency, uh, especially on the part of the host countries. Um, and it and it struck me that at least in some of these deals, and we use the term unsustainable because there are a lot of deals that strike me and I think many as as unsustainable, either on the side of the host governments or on on the Chinese side. And sort of what is it that brings about that unsustainability and where does the agency come in there? Uh, and part of what we try to do in the paper is explain, at least in the Sri Lanka case, but in others, that there's a history to that relationship. Uh, and especially in a, in a place like Sri Lanka uh, and in others where there's been conflict, um, that governments come out of that conflict um, often with very few options. And in some of those cases, China's been a willing partner. And then it comes back to the question of just how projects are selected at all. And there's, I think, infrastructure projects around the world, including in the United States, can often be highly politicized. Politicians like to cut ribbons uh, in anticipation of elections. So there's a kind of political nature to them. And then this brings us back to one of the themes of our paper, which was sort of why is it that you sort of get some poor decision making at certain times? What's the process that goes into that? Um, what kind of breaks are there on on those decisions? And, and then this brings us back to classic questions of project selection and why over over time, World Bank and other development finance institutions have built in uh, important checks uh, and measures on, on governance. So I think we, we see in each individual case a sort of specific relationship and background with, with China in terms of what that, how that relationship is developed, um, why they have certain kind of partnerships. And then uh, it really depends on this question of sort of how projects are, are selected. And sometimes that is a process which is highly political, which is very far removed from 
careful economic calculations. You've heard me talk about Venezuela. That relationship and those decisions to do debt deals with China were deeply, deeply political. Uh, and then on the Chinese side, if there are also reasons why the the sort of you know soft budget constraints or reasons to do more than less in terms of BRI and infrastructure projects, easy access to finance, you can end up with a sort of toxic mix. And we're not saying this happens all the time, and it may actually be less frequent um, than, than is often considered, but you kind of can see how both sides can come together to make poor decisions, which then any, everyone ends up having to pay for. Matt, in, in the paper you mentioned uh, that you know, in a lot of cases of, of these bad deals, you, the, one, of, one of the factors is that Chinese actors face a bunch of distorted commercial and, and political incentives. Can you unpack a little bit what some of those incentives are? Well, I think political and, and then economic, but I think we've all seen that since 2013 and the rollout of BRI, there's nothing else quite like it in terms of China's foreign presence. Um, you just saw people come out of the woodwork in terms of uh, academics and think tanks and officials and businesses to support this thing, to show their political loyalty, but also because there's money uh, available, um, there's support, there's financing available for it. And you can see this with domestic projects as well. And this goes back, back to, to Eric's comment. Um, about sort of poor decision making in China itself. You see this with property development, with infrastructure projects within China too. If there is a political reason to support a kind of project and then the financing system gets behind it, then I think for a lot of institutions, banks and, and firms, especially state-owned firms, if they think that the cost of capital is low uh, and that they're really not going to have to pay the price uh, in if, if something goes wrong, and if they can show their political loyalties for something like this signature BRI project, then go for it. And you can just see how that sort of lines up to do projects rather than not do them, to, to label them uh, as BRI projects, uh, and to wrap it all up with a bow without enough of the sort of step-by-step -step process that should go into evaluating whether it's a good project or not. Anarchy, let me pick up the theme a little bit with you on this question of incompetence and incentives. For a lot of China critics, people in India, the United States, and many parts of Africa, they do not buy the idea that China or these decisions are incompetent. They believe that the Chinese know exactly what they're doing. They believe that decision-making is far more competent than what you are alleging in your paper for it to be. Um, what do you say to those critics who, who discount the idea of the crossed incentive lines and also this question of the fact that you wrote in your paper that a lot of the people making these decisions actually don't know the cultures, the countries, the backgrounds, the histories of the countries that they're, they're making these deals in. So you've made that case. How do you respond to critics who don't buy it? Yeah, I, I would say to critics that they are overestimating China's experience as a lender. Um, I think that it is undeniable that miscalculations on China's part have led to losses on both sides, both for host countries as well as for China. And I think Sri Lanka is a very good example of this as well, because in 2015, when the government changed, large-scale infrastructure projects like the Colombo Port City were suspended for months on end. And Chinese investors on that project lost a lot of money in a very short period of time. So at that time, at least on China's part, there was really no clear understanding of how the public had come to view these projects or, or even how politicized these projects had become. There was also probably a lot of confidence that the political environment wouldn't change before the project came to a close. So yes, I absolutely think that we are seeing China having to struggle with changing political and economic situations. And I think we are also seeing the mistakes they're making and how they're losing out because of it. Um, but I think the, the bigger problem really is the fact that I think the nature of Chinese financing sometimes exacerbates already existing structural and institutional inefficiencies in developing countries. Sri Lanka is a post-conflict middle-income country, and there are very, very many things about infrastructure financing and development that Sri Lanka itself still needs to figure out. I spent a lot of time this past summer really trying to get to the, some of the heart of these challenges and 
you know, I really came to understand some of the issues that the country is facing. Uh, for instance, the country does not have an independent debt management agency. Uh, it currently does not have a mechanism for identifying broader infrastructure priorities. And I think what Chinese financing does or what China's miscalculation does is that it exacerbates these issues to a greater extent and it contributes uh, to losses on both sides. Um, you, another another factor you mention in the article is that Chinese the, the level of Chinese risk assessment is actually quite low um, and that there, there isn't a very well developed kind of like risk assessment sector, you know, kind of informing some of the planning around this. How has Chinese um, approaches to risk, how, how, how have, they adapt, have they evolved over the years? Yeah, I, I think this is, it's developing rapidly. I would say this all began around 2011, 2012. Um, there were some events certainly in Libya and Myanmar really kicked this off, a sense that China's outbound investments and, and loans were potentially exposed to geopolitical forces uh, that were too little understood um, by by the Chinese government, by, by Chinese firms. Now, that's not that long ago. So we're just talking, you know, seven, eight years. Um, and this is something that is, that is developing rapidly, but it's really piecemeal. Um, you see a kind of growing industry on the Chinese side. Um, a lot of Chinese firms, including uh, government bureaucracies, um, SinoSure, uh, which ensures some of the lending and approves the lending, um, some of the state-owned enterprises, um, even SASAC, which oversees uh, the, the state-owned enterprises, is trying to build in some of this political risk analysis. You see a, a lot a lot more discussion about corporate social responsibility. So this term that we talk about of sustainability um, sort of factors in here a little bit, especially on, on corporate social responsibility, on environmental assessment uh, and, and social assessment. But but there are a lot of questions remaining about uh, how much of that is just lip service, um, how much of a gap there still is in terms of truly understanding what all of the complexities are on the ground. And then this goes back to the really very new nature of sort of area studies or learning about what's happening in these countries. So I would say there's absolutely a growing sense of attention uh, in China, new institutions being created, businesses that are out there to do the kind of consulting that we see in the US and Europe on political risk. Um, but it's still not clear how committed, uh, especially state-owned enterprises, but also many smaller Chinese firms are to doing this, and then how capable they are. And then this goes back to the, the host government side as well. If you're dealing with governments that make decisions on behalf of their people without enough input, you can still get a lot of local reactions which are quite negative to deals which are signed off on by, by both governments. And then that undermines you know, any kind of political risk assessment that may have been done that said, oh, yeah, the government approves of this. But then what about the local population? You know, what I liked about your paper the most was the fact that it didn't, and I'm a non-academic, and so I like it when you when people actually speak in English and language that I understand rather than some of the more kind of highfalutin type of talk. And you said straight up, I mean, you guys did not mince word, mince words here, that the, the Chinese were tone deaf, and that's your words, in their inability to anticipate how the world would respond to some of these arrangements and some of the loans. And I, I just love how direct you guys came out and said it. I mean, it was it was because that's exactly what it was. It does seem like, though, that the message has gotten through. I've had a lot of conversations with uh, both scholars in China and also government officials, and they it just grates on them, this American critique and the debt trap narrative as a whole, uh, not just from the United States, but everybody. And, and then it, this kind of came to life back in April when President Xi Jinping addressed the second Belt and Road Forum. And he called for an end of vanity projects, and he said, we're going to tighten up. He's going to bring the anti-corruption drive that has been so pervasive domestically in China, and he's going to now bring that into the Belt and Road. And it does seem like now that some of the messaging of the debt trap narrative may actually produce a more focused strategy on the part of China and that they're getting they're 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 getting it a little bit. So anarchically in in Beijing, where you are right now, and some of the stakeholders that you interact with at at the universities and scholars and even the government official level, talk to us a little bit about, are things starting to change now, particularly after President Xi's speech? Yeah, I I absolutely uh, think that 
things will change in the future. Um, I mean, let me actually go back to a little bit to Sri Lanka on this point, because um, a lot of people in the government that I spent time talking to over the years have said, yes, you know, with regards to Hamban Thota, we... we fully, you know, believe that the the commercial decision on Hambantota was a good one, the government should have made it, however the optics look bad and, you know, giving uh, sort of doing the debt to equity swap for 99 years is a terrible look and this idea that, you know, people agreed to it and how they agreed to it and why they agreed to it is sort of something that uh, you know, academics and policymakers will disagree with. So I do think that your point on yes, in some ways there is both China and host countries are sort of tone deaf to the optics of some of these projects. Um, but as you said, I do think that they are recognizing that this is a significant issue um, and that they have to address this issue. And I think that, yeah, at the at the BRI forum, Xi Jinping's, uh, Xi Jinping's um, speech very much sort of, um, you know, address some of these issues, particularly issues with regard to debt sustainability. Um, with respect to, you know, people in Beijing, like scholars and policymakers, I do think that there is a general consensus that China has to, in some ways, address these issues in order to be taken seriously, in order to gain more leverage, um, in order to be taken seriously as a lender on the global stage. So, I mean, I think that, again, we might need, that we will need to give it some time to really understand how seriously they are about this and how seriously they're going to take it. But I am hopeful about it. Um, following up on that, um, in, you know, one of the points, larger points in the article is that it points to the Hambantota situation, points to the fact that the BRI, the BRI financing model itself is frequently quite problematic. Um, do you do you foresee, you know, other mechanisms like, for example, public-private partnerships becoming more dominant in along the BRI? Or are we essentially... S- s- Exactly, exactly. Um, you know, or are we essentially, uh, is, is the power of Chinese state banks, are they, is, are they so locked in that we'll pretty much see the same model as we've seen so far? Um, I've got a, a few thoughts on that coming from Europe. Um, as you know, I, I did a project last year looking at the Chinese finance railway uh, in Hungary and Serbia. Uh, and one of the clearest messages that I heard there, and you know, the 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 narrative is that that sort of Hungary and Serbia are in China's back pocket, um, but that is really not the case at all. And what I heard a lot of there was deep criticism of the financing model that was used, which was a China export import bank model, exactly of the kind that we see used uh, in in Africa and elsewhere. Um, and and the sense was that loans made very little sense because all of the risk was on the host government side and they said we want investment rather than lending. So I think what we're going to see is some pressure as different governments experience some of the downsides uh, of the the lending side of this and when they when the when it's not sustainable to be paid back there's a sense like why are we taking loans at all and why is the government taking on sovereign loans uh, when there could potentially be other models and then this is really where you know leverage comes in and you know not all governments not all countries are going to be in the same position on this so Hungary has access to EU funding for infrastructure. They can go to the EU for that. Serbia does not. Um, so Serbia has a lot less leverage when it comes to this. Clearly, countries in Southeast Asia and South Asia, Africa, and Latin America are all going to come to this negotiation table uh, with very different kind of assets. But what I see is a growing sense uh, that the, the, there's an imbalance in terms of who's taking the risk and what governments want, I think, is to see true investment on the Chinese side where the risk is more balanced, where Chinese side takes more risk. And whether that's coming from private, smaller Chinese entities or even state-owned enterprises, what they want to see is more balance there. The, again, the question is, who's got the leverage to make those deals that come out maybe more favorably for smaller, poorer, more, more vulnerable countries? Let me just challenge that notion a little bit there, because I understand why the host governments may want to say Say that, But at the end of the day, the Chinese government may not want to give up control 
and control is something that's very important to them. And when they kind of go down, this is one one argument against more private sector engagement from the Chinese, because the Chinese government likes to be able to to drive the process. And if private entities are doing it, they lose that that ability to control the process. That's number one. Number two, the private sector, I think obviously for a railroad in Hungary, that makes sense. It's close to the European Union. It's on the fringes of, of this the, the world's largest consumer market. In, in Botswana, that's not the case. And I don't know if Botswana has any leverage. And this was a point that, uh, that some scholars brought up, that agency really depends on who you are. So not every country has the same level of agency. So a, con- a very small, poor, landlocked country without any resources you know, doesn't really have the ability to push back on the Chinese and say, well, we want private sector. That's one issue. The second issue is that we know for a fact that the private sector is not really engaged in taking those kinds of risks on massive infrastructure projects that have a very low probability of quick payback, much less a long-term payback. So the private sector, I don't know. I mean, they're not going to fund big Nigerian railways. This has got to be something from the state, I think, in some senses. What's what's your response to that, Matt, those two points there? Yeah, well, the first one, I completely agree with you on. Uh, there's just so, you know, countries come with extremely different levels of negotiating power here. And then, you know, there's a lot of um, incentives to sort of look at those Chinese deal. They're guaranteed by the Chinese government. They mean that the project will probably get done. Um, there are a lot of reasons why the, the host governments enter into these deals. And, and as you make very clear, the, you know, countries have very different sort of negotiating tools here. Um, on on and, and I also agree that, uh, that, that to the extent that smaller or private firms on the Chinese side or from anywhere, really, um, they're probably going to have a much bigger challenge when coming to this. But they also might be making better decisions when it comes to saying, you know what, that's not a viable project. And this is one of the themes of our, of our paper. And I know it's easy for us to say, which is do better project selection and implementation. But if the incentives are misaligned when it comes to state-backed finance on the Chinese side, and so you're getting projects done that shouldn't be done, maybe some of these projects just shouldn't be done. And maybe governments shouldn't put themselves into into debt for projects where the money may be better spent in, in other areas. Again, easy for me to say, um, but I do think that there's got to be a bit of a recalibration here in thinking about why projects are viable or good or not. And there's been, I think, a little bit too much emphasis on the decision, of, let's just do big infrastructure projects because they need to be done. And the, the narrative is that infrastructure will lead to development. Well, that's a complicated scenario, and maybe China um, needs to, to rethink that along with the partners, and, and maybe it's a, it's a healthy dose of reality to say maybe we just shouldn't do certain projects. Um, one, of the, one of the points that we haven't really touched on so far um, is corruption. Um, and, you, you know, so uh, unlikely, I wonder if you could, if, you could if, if it is possible for you to speak to what kind of role corruption or possible corruption played in the Sri Lankan case. Um, and you know, kind of what what might be ways to try and, and and lessen its impact? Yeah, I certainly think that corruption plays and has played a role in the development of unsustainable projects. Um, Matt and I touch on this a little bit in our piece, in particular, sort of pointing out how it influences project selection and also project implementation. And certainly this is true in Hambantota as well. We know that political leaders had misaligned incentives to develop the infrastructure projects that they did and also develop them in the locations that they did. Um, but I, corruption also plays a role in other ways, for example, in the sequencing of projects. So generally, even if you agree with the strategic vision of the Hambanto report, you can understand that perhaps the government need not have built the Hambantara port and the Matula airport and a cricket stadium and an international conference center all at the same time. That we could have sequenced these projects out over a longer period of time, giving each of these projects and investments time to operationalize and succeed. But of course, we know that at least for the former Uh, president, there was a need to accumulate political capital at the time, and that this really was one of the motivating factors behind the drive to build all of these projects at the same time. 
With regards to lessening its impact, I think that for Sri Lanka, there has to be a lot more consultation with both public and private entities on on the infrastructure decisions that are being made. And uh, of course, I think there has to be greater transparency. Before 2015, it was virtually impossible for the public to scrutinize any of these dealings because there was very little access to information. So I think Sri Lanka must develop the institutions and partnerships necessary to really tackle uh, corruption head on. I'd like to wrap up our conversation today looking to the future and and where we're going to be in two, four, five years. Are we going to still be in the same discussion about the debt trap narrative? Or do you think that the Chinese will find a way to actually communicate their story? Or will, I mean, where do we go? I mean, what do you see as you're forecasting? I know you guys don't have a crystal ball, but based on the research that you've done and the trends that you're seeing now, what direction are we going in? Matt, let's start with you first, then Anarchy, I'd like to get your comments on that. Yeah, that's a great question. To me, this comes back to something that we discussed earlier, sort of related to risk issues and also sort of the Chinese response to what they're hearing um, uh, about this debt trap uh, diplomacy narrative, um, which, which is learning. Uh, and it's not just the Chinese side, and that's incredibly important. What is China taking as the lesson from hearing about these critiques uh, of whether it's debt trap diplomacy or, as we put it, unsustainable uh, debt? Um, wh- who's learning what and what lessons will be applied? Is it just going to be words um, and policy pronouncements about how China will do better? Or will there actually be learning because it's in China's interest to learn? And then there's learning on the host country sides. And this is one of the, the issues that, that we bring up, uh, which is that it, one recommendation would be for just a lot more lesson sharing uh, among governments, among, uh, among academics, among business especially in the more vulnerable, smaller countries, if they can share lessons, maybe they can do better when it comes to choosing projects and structuring them. So to me, it all hinges uh, on the learning process um, that that happens on both sides. And I'm hopeful that there will be, but certainly um, we have a long history of you know, lending, especially for infrastructure, being incredibly difficult to do. But I, But I tend to be optimistic that things will improve over time. I would like to reiterate what Matt said in that I think lesson sharing is going to be incredibly important in the future. Um, And I also think that both sides need to buy in and make commitments to risk assessments and also environmental assessments. This is something, as I said before, uh, that China is taking more seriously, but I think host countries will need to insist on in the future. And finally, I think that it is very important that countries engaging with China also work to overcome some of their own domestic obstacles to infrastructure financing uh, that I mentioned before. But I am confident and hopeful that these changes will take place in the future and that we really will see better lending practices going forward. The article is Why Unsustainable Chinese Infrastructure Deals Are a Two-Way Street. It's a paper on the Carnegie Chinhua Center for Global Policy. It came out back in July. Uh, it's an excellent read and a really nice complement to the broader discussion about the debt trap narrative. Also, very quickly want to bring your attention to another article that came out, The Debt Trap Diplomacy Debate, Are China's Loans Predatory? by Lucas Nguyenhuis uh, from China, And he does a really good kind of rundown of it. And these two articles pair together very, very nicely. We'll put links to them both down there. Um, Matt Furchin, non-resident scholar at Carnegie Chinhua, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's really a pleasure. If people want to follow the work that you're you're doing these days, is there any way for them to get in touch with you? Sure. They can uh, get in touch with me either through the Carnegie site. They can find all my work there um, or my personal website. It's got my email. Okay. And we'll put links down there as well. Enerkly, are you on uh, social media by any chance? I am indeed. Um, I am on Twitter. And you can also email me at anarkali.pereira at gmail.com for any questions. And Enerkly Pereira is a lecturer in international politics and economics at the China Foreign Affairs University in Beijing. Uh, Together with Matt, they wrote an excellent paper that we really think is a critical piece of this broader understanding of what the debt trap narrative is. Uh, Thank you both for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. You know, Kobus, we're at the point now where serious people who use the debt trap argument 
either are ignorant or are intentional. And I mean that in the sense that as an American, our politics have changed so much over the past few years, where people who know better intentionally use language that is provocative and divisive because it achieves a different objective. So there is another part of this, I think, because there are so many people out there that are so passionate in their distrust and their hatred of China, some of it justified, I'm not going to get into that, but that this debt trap narrative fits very, very nicely in that. I'm thinking also, by the way, of the Indian media. And the Indian media in particular is very, very much, very enthusiastic about promoting the debt trap narrative, particularly as it relates to Habandota. So this is not uniquely an American thing. Um, People in Africa and Zambia, Kenya and Djibouti in particular, we've heard a lot of that concern as well. The Chinese don't help themselves because they don't come back with any compelling counter argument. If in fact there is no debt trap, I'm not going to take a side as to whether there is or there isn't. I take the side of Deborah Braudigam here in that there is not any evidence to support that there is. But, and I'd like your take on this, Kobus. There's another theory that the Chinese might be playing the long game here, and that the goal was never to take the port of Mombasa. That's a stupid narrative. That's a a colonial imperial narrative that the Chinese were never playing by. But the idea is, is that in 20 years, countries that are so wrapped up in Chinese debt simply don't have any other choice than at the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization or at the World Health Organization or at any of these smaller agencies or even at the IMF to line up behind the Chinese because they have to. And maybe that's the game that they're playing. And so we might not be looking at it in the right time context here. Maybe the time frame is very different. I, I, I'm Again, we don't know because no one's telling us. But I just want to open up the, side, the discussion a little bit broader than there simply is no debt trap. Yes. No, I mean, you know, there isn't, I, I don't think there's a debt trap, but, I, but there still is debt, you know, and that that has its own its own implications. Um, it'll be very interesting to do a study, I wish someone would do a study actually, to, to, to conclusively track how countries were, who are, who carry a lot of Chinese debt, how, how they vote in the United Nations, you know. To actually, to actually prove whether, whether there's a one-to-one relationship between those two. You know, so, so th- th- that's one thing. I mean, in the second place, I, I think China itself is, is learning very rapidly. And they, they also, like, you know, kind of gained a lot of lessons um, from the Hambatota situation as well as from several other uh, projects that, you know, were not necessarily going as well as they should have. Um, and one of the things that, that they're really pushing down on is, is uh, you know, f- is focusing a lot more on on sustainability, not only debt sustainability, but environmental sustainability, um, and then also avoiding this kind of you know the the optics of of funding vanity projects. What one of the things that Matt um, and Anakli suggested in the paper is that they the the that China should um, consider a, a version, their own version of the of the U.S. Um, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Um, so I wanted to ask you whether you think there's a chance in hell, yeah? They do have one, by the way. No, 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 no. They have one on the books. There is a Chinese Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. It's not enforced. There is zero enforcement over it. And the problem is, is that when you have a country that doesn't have a judicial legal system, there's an administrative legal system in China, but not a judicial one. It's a big difference it's not rule of law in China, it's rule by law. Now, that's a, a small distinction, but a very important one. Because at the end of the day, the Communist Party controls the courts. So you will not have the China National Petroleum Corporation come up on charges f- uh, on corruption. That will not happen under any circumstances in any scenario, and as far as I can see. Because their political power, I mean, this is what, the second or third largest corporation in the world by revenue? Uh, They are incredibly powerful. In Beijing, they're very powerful. They're not going to get brought up on charges for for bribing anybody. So, you know, that's one issue. I thought you were going to go somewhere else, Kobus, and on the transparency issue. Because that, at the end of the day, is, I think, the big problem here. Is that we just don't know what's going on and the Chinese aren't saying anything. And then the transparency issue, by the way, goes both ways. That's not just a Chinese problem. Notice on the Kenyan oil deal, the Kenyans aren't talking about how they came to the fact that the Chinese won the bid. 
Yeah, that's the big issue. That's, you know, that's, and in Africa, that's definitely the issue. Um, because there, it again comes down, as, as I frequently say, it comes down to a lack of trust between African governments and African populations. Um, and, you know, African civil society has been, has been relatively good to the extent that they've had the, the ability to, um, to, you know, to, to focus attention on some of these deals. But there's a lot more work that needs to be done to, f- to force African governments to be more transparent. Yeah, I want to l- l- close our show with words again by Lucas Neuenhaus from SUP China, where he said, while there are real issues with transparency and corruption in Chinese loans, and no one can dispute that, quote unquote, the debt trap is not an accurate characterization. And I think that is anybody who's serious will come to that conclusion. And I mean anybody who's serious who's genuinely looking at this in an apolitical way. If you have a political agenda that extends beyond understanding the facts and you want to hit China you know, where it hurts, okay, then I, I understand someone like Peter Navarro is going to keep saying these things because it's part of a bigger, broader agenda of, uh, of boxing in China and, and punching China in the, in the throat. But if you are a serious analyst or trying to understand this on any level – delete debt trap from your, your your vocabulary as far as, as what basically what all the scholars and anybody who's actually looked into this is actually saying. So what do you think? Tell us. Uh, this is a highly, highly contentious issue that touches on a lot of different things. It depends a lot on how you kind of see the Chinese Communist Party. It depends on do you, uh, do you believe the incompetence narrative that has been put forward that the Chinese don't actually know what they're doing? in many parts of the world and making loans and not doing proper risk assessment, not doing the feasibility studies, just kind of the money's flowing. Or as Cobus brought up in the show, is it a question of corruption that people are just making too much cash or the incentives as Matt brought up are just not aligned that the incentives, and we didn't get into this too much are such that, you know, the people giving the loans are not the ones who have to worry about the debt and they get rewarded for giving out the loans, but not actually promoting a sustainable economic model for the Chinese in the long term, or at the end of the day, as Kobus brought up at the end, is it really about the host governments? Should people like Uhuru Kenyatta be taking on these loans in the first place? The Chinese are not forcing loans on these countries. If, they, if Kenyatta said he didn't want the loans, that's it. The Chinese walk away, but he does want the loans. So where does the responsibility lie? We'd love to hear from you. Uh, quickly before we go, Kobus, um, let's have a quick little chat about our, our soft launch of our website, that uh, that came out this week, hopefully, by the time that we're recording this one week before, so we're praying to whatever God is above us that the site is actually out by now. But let's assume for that it's out. Uh, tell You know, here we are, eight months into this. We've launched a brand new website with uh, a new news feed. It's got uh, analysis section that you and I are working on together. We've got uh, this great new China-Africa experts network where we're collecting names of people who are you know, in the China-Africa space, but even just in the China space or in the development space, and you want to connect with other people in the arts, in journalism, in activists, uh, corporate, venture capital, academics like Anarchy and uh, and Matt, and, and even you, Kobus, you're in there as well. So, uh, you know, exciting times. Yeah, it's very, very exciting. We're also, we're also launching a student exchange service where we're featuring the the writing of of high school and, and undergrad university students on different different issues of China Africa relations, frequently trying to get African and Chinese voices about the same issue. Um, so it's a, it's a really exciting kind of venture to try and follow what the new generation of China Africa scholars are saying. So what we're going to do is this all leads up to on September thirtieth. We're going to do a whole show on this and kind of. Uh, kind of explain all the cool things that are going on here at the China Africa Project. But we're going to be starting a subscription service for a daily email newsletter. Now, if you get our Friday newsletter, you will already be familiar with the kind of richness of the content that we're putting forward. Cobus is writing a lot for that. And uh, it's your basically your daily intelligence brief on China Africa, what people are saying, what the quotes are, what's moving, what's not. This is a relationship changing so fast. And every day I'm going to sit there and put together this email. Cobus is going to copy edit it and check it. So we're going to work on it together. And it will get into your inbox 6 a.m. Washington time, 6 p.m. Beijing time. And it is, uh, it's going to be a great thing. We're going to be charging $149 a year or $15 a month. Uh, we would love your support. Uh, it's independent journalism at its best. Uh, we've been doing this for 10 years now. Uh, we're so grateful to all of our followers who've supported us over the years and the listeners of the podcast. And so we're just really both 
slightly terrified, excited, thrilled to be going to the next level and hope that we can get your support uh, as well. And would love to hear your feedback uh, on it as well. So we're going to do a dedicated show to this in early October once all the little wrinkles are ironed out out of the system. But we just want to give you, our loyal listeners who made it all the way to the end of the program, a little bit of a heads up about some of the cool new things that we're doing here at the China Africa Project. So we'll be back again next week with another edition of the show. For Kobus van Staden in Johannesburg, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Studinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China and Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com. Mm-hmm.